Hey everybody, today on Rado Runs 2, we're previewing a prototype of the sixth realm. But before I get going, please turn your subtitles on to the Klingon channel so that when I make rules goose, you'll know what they are. And if you've done that, well then welcome to the beautiful sixth realm where we have come to make our fortune by hobnobbing with the queen, by building homes, by doing merchant actions, exploring a scary dungeon, um, you know, uh, recording our deeds for posterity with the historians, and building up infrastructure while we explore the land. Oh, and also hanging out with scribes. Let's not forget the scribes, very important. And we're going to be doing all of this under the auspices of the Stone Council. And I'm going to show you how it works today in a two-player run-through. It's me, the orange player, up against Jen, the blue player. And before I get going, folks, I just want to tell you, this game is huge. Physically huge. I mean, I can't even fit this entire board on camera. You'll notice the bottom of the board and the top of the board is cut off. So my apologies, the Stone Council track and the Victory Point track. If, if, if I have to go off screen, I'll explain what's happening. Um, so it's gigantic in terms of table space, but also in terms of breadth and depth and scope. There's so much going on in this game. It's basically like six mini games packed into one game. And so... I might not be able to show you everything in this run-through, but if you want to know everything about this game, might I suggest you check the link down in the show notes, because that'll take you to Rotto Learns How to Play the Sixth Realm. Because Alex Hart of Might I Suggest a Game came to my house, brought this prototype to me, and taught me everything I know. And he can teach you as well. He'll go into exhausting detail about how all the guilds work. I'll try to show as much as I can in this run-through, but if you want to know everything there's a no. There's the link down in the show notes, and Alex does an amazing job teaching how to play this game. But right, let's let's put it to the test. <clears throat> how? What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to walk you through a little bit more of what makes this game, this particular session, different than any other game uh, session I've ever played of it. Because there's a lot of randomized stuff. There's all these different tiles in the Historian Guild that represent traditions of the people. There's four unique artifacts, uh, a combination of artifacts in the dungeon. There's all those relics that are randomly chosen up there. Um, but most importantly of all, the um, Stone Council here, let's see if I can zoom in on it, has each has a, a a flag for each of the six guilds of the sixth realm, and they have been randomly placed around. I'm going to call it the Queen Scepter or Trident, I suppose. And what this says is, this is the Queen ordering us to do things in a specific order for the entire game. For the rest of the game, unless things change, the Queen is always going to want us first to do green merchant actions, then blue explore because she'll move and point to it, then red um, dungeon actions, then gray building actions, then purple history actions, and finally, the last one, brown scribes. Every year, and we're going to play over three years, players are going to do these six actions in this order, uh, and then there's a bonus seventh action that will be chosen by one of the players. We'll worry about that later. Each year, um, we're getting to do um, seven total actions. Six of them will be in this order. Unless we decide to um, buck the trend and say no to the queen. Because you'll notice, this says what the queen wants to do, but the other little sides of her trident say, hey, if you spend a brown resource, you could ignore the green and do a scribe action. Or if you send a blue resource, you could ignore the queen's edict and do a blue action. Now, early in the game, you're not likely to do that. Chances are, players are going to do stuff in the order the queen said, because it is very expensive to ignore the queen's orders and do other stuff. But later in the game, as we become more rich and powerful, you'll find that happening more often. Maybe it'll happen in this first year. We'll see as we go. Anyway, though, so the queen is decreed. It's going to be Merchantville right out of the gate. And um, who is the first player? Oh, that's me. Why? Because each player gets one of these little things that um, you know sets their starting. Me, I started out um, with the higher number than Jen. I'm number three. She's number one. So I get to go first. I got, for my troubles... A brown seal, there it is right there. One ink, there it is right there. And I got to improve my standing with the Red Dungeoneer Guild. So I've got a little plus one. When we get to the third round and we're doing dungeon stuff, I'm going to be the best in the land at exploring the dungeon. Um, because I got that. Plus I have one of each of the three resources. Jen, meanwhile... She has a lower number, so she doesn't go first. She has a purple seal, which she loves. Purple is her favorite color. Um, and she's better with the Merchant Guild. How fortuitous for her that Jen gets to do her superpower 
very beginning because um, what this means is it shows, hey, you get to flip your green book. All these books indicate how popular we are, how influential we are with the different guilds, and they all start out in the blank page, but Jen's started flipped. So Jen is a better at merchant than me, and we'll see that play out unless I decide to ignore the queen and not do merchant and do other things. All right. Anyway, that's the setup. And I got to say, folks, the order of this can radically change the game. If this was a game where we were starting out with historian, just even a change as simple as that would mean our first turn would be historians, which means we'd be chasing after bonus actions sooner as opposed to trying to invest in resources. Um, this defines the feel of the game from session to session. All right. And it's a good thing we have some control over it and more control that we'll talk about later. Okay, so... I am the first player. What you do on your turn is, there's several steps. First, if you earn a guild bonus, you get it. And that's what these little things are. If at some point later in the game, I have um, said, hey, let's take this popularity bonus and put it at the top of my guild influence tracker, then when we're doing guild stuff, I would get that bonus. Now, of course, we haven't made those investments yet, so skip that. Next, I can do free actions, which means I can spend ink to write on scrolls, and I've got two scrolls at the beginning, or if I had any recruited envoys, I could trigger their bonus actions. Now, I have one ink, and right now is not a good time to do either of these scrolls. You'll see them happen soon enough, but I'm not going to do it right now. So I'm skipping that free action I can do, and I have no envoys, so I can't really do any free actions with them. So I'm skipping the guild bonuses, I'm skipping my free actions, you'll see them later, and now we're going right to the Merchant's Guild, where uh, we've got a little menu telling us what we can do. Every one of these guilds has a menu. Over here in the Builder's Guild is the menu. Over here in the Historian Guild is the menu. So what's on the menu for merchant mercantile business? Well, if I spend one action point, I can refresh spent resources. If I spend three action points, I can get completely new resources. And if I cut the difference, if I spend two action points, I can improve my standing with any of the guilds. I am the first player. I am going to do potentially one or more of these actions based on how many action points I have. How many action points do I have? I'm glad you asked. We come back to my board. I am down at the bottom. The guild merchant does not love me. None of them love me. But my book isn't flipped either. So that means I have one action point. If my book was flipped like Jen's, I'd have one, two action points. But I just have one action point to spend. But um, when you're figuring out how many action points you have, I can spend resources. Everybody starts with three. This... Um, coal that can go towards green merchant actions or gray building actions. This knapsack full of gear that can help you with blue explore and red dungeoneering. And this um, royal parchment edict that can help with scribe and um, historian actions. And here's the deal. If I want to have more action points to do the green merchant action, I can spend my green resource, thereby eliminating my red resource, my gray resource. I've suddenly just made myself worse because if I don't flip this, I'm going to have one action point. But that means I'll have this when we eventually get to building and I could spend it to make myself a better builder instead of a better merchant. And that's the thing. If I'm going to be a better merchant and be a worse builder or vice versa, I'm going to spend it. I am going to spend it, which means I bump up one. And now I've got three action points instead of one. Now, if I had another one of these, I could flip it as well and go up to five action points, which would be great. But as it is, I'm just going up to three, and now I've, I've spent everything. I don't have anything more to spend. I don't have a bonus from the book. So we know my action points are three, and I mark that here on this little tracker to say, hey, I've got three action points, and then this comes back down. It resets. This is basically a calculator. Um, and then once you figure it out, you mark it here. And I should say, early in the game... You don't really need to do that. For the first few turns, you know, oh, I've got one, maybe I've got three action points. It's very simple. But later in the game, when you get into year two and three, oh my gosh, you might have seven, eight, nine action points. Believe me, you will be thankful that you have this little thing to keep track of. Right, how many more action points do I have? Because I just did a really complex thing. Oh, I've got three more because I'm using a little tracker. So anyway, I've transferred my action points to the tracker to tell me I've got three. Now, let's go shopping. How am I going to spend my three? 
Now, the easiest thing to do would just be to spend all three of it, boom, and buy myself another resource. Um, and then I'd be spent. I'd be done. Or I could spend two to upgrade my standing with a guild, and then I could spend one to re refresh a resource. That could be pretty handy. You know what? I think I kind of like that. I'm going to spend my three... Two of it here, and then one of it here. But here's the trick, folks. You may have noticed this adorable little merchant cart. I have to move that merchant cart every time I do an action, and that determines what guild I'm interacting with. Now, because I'm already in good with the Adventurer Guild, remember that's my starter? I think I want to become an even better adventurer, so that when the Queen eventually says, hey, go delving in the dungeon, I'll be able to dig deep. Um, I think I'm excited about that. So let's give it a go. I am going to spend two of my three action points to flip a book uh, for a guild. Which guild am I interacting with? I'm interacting with the Red Guild. Right. So uh, if I wanted to flip my blue book, I'd move this over here. But I'm interacting with the Red Guild to spend two action points to flip my red book. And remember, it started flipped, giving me plus one. Now, I'm going to flip it again. Because if you look closely, you'll notice, oh, what's on the next page? The opportunity to um, increase my guild rank. So I'm flipping it, thereby resetting it, losing my plus one. But my rank within the red guild has gone up. And so now, for the rest of the game, anytime I do a dungeon action, I start with three action points instead of one. Boom! I am going to rock that dungeon to its core. That is my mission. Don't worry, Queen. When we get there, oh, I'm going to be diving deep. All right. So that was me spending two... And I, I mark it here. I just spent two of my three action points. But I'm not done yet. I've got one more action. So now, what could I do? I could spend my last... I, I don't have three. I don't have two. So I've got one action point left. And that says, hey, refresh... A, um, a spent resource? That's perfect. It's like I planned this, folks. Let's go on ahead and say I'm going to spend my last action point to refresh a resource. And which one's it going to be? My green-gray one. So how can I do it? Well, I've already interacted with red. I can't interact with the red guild again. So I'm going to go clockwise and interact with the green. And because I've moved here, that means if I had three action points, I could buy another green resource, which would be awesome. If I had two action points, I could upgrade my standing with the green guild. But I only have one. So I'm spending my last one to get my green resource back. So it's like I didn't spend anything. Boom. And that was it. I spent my last resource. Okay, now... Um, after I've done, I spent three action points, I've done them in a different way, and I've left this here. That means what I've done is, I have prevented Jen, when she does her merchant action, from being able to interact with the green guild. Because she's got to move on and interact with the purple guild or the red guild. Now, I'll worry about that on her turn, but she's already shaking her fist at me, because that's totally what she would have wanted to interact with. But, hey, there is a almost throughout the game, it is such a big deal to go first. How Holding on to first is a big, big deal. Deal. And we'll see that as we evolve. So anyway, I spent all three of my action points. Now, at the beginning of my turn, remember, I could do free actions. I could spend ink or envoys. At the end of my turn, I could spend ink or envoys. And if I had not been so clever as to get my resource back, I might have spent my ink to write on that scroll, because that scroll would have said, oh, get a resource back. But I don't need to do it. I'm saving my ink for a rainy day, because that ink don't run. All right, so... That was it for me. I finished my turn. It is now Jen's turn. And Jen, first of all, she has no guild bonus. Right? So she doesn't get that. She can do free actions. Same as me. She's not going to do them right yet. Um, she then says, hey, I'll do green. I will spend my green resource. And um, that moves me up one. So she's got three. Plus one means she has four action points. So she's going to get a little bit more out of this. But the thing she would most like to do, uh, invest in the green guild so she can become even better at it the way I did with the red guild, she can't do it because I blocked her. So if she wants to interact with a guild, um, coming back over here, well, she has to interact with the purple. And if she goes with the purple, the next interaction has to be with the blue and then the gray. Because the trick is, once you start moving this, you have to keep going. So if Jen wants to, she could interact with the red guild 
and then the Brown Guild, and then the Gray Guild if she has enough action points, or she could go the other way. The one thing she can't do, because she can't go to the purple and then turn around and come back and interact with the green. I have denied her that. So how is she going to spend her four action points? Well, I'll tell you what she's going to do. I will tell you what she's going to do. She, since she has four, she's going to spend three of them and get another resource. Because having those resources is everything. And there's so few of them. Remember, we started with um, just three of these double resources. Jen's going to get herself a fourth. and But she has to choose. Does she want it to be the purple-brown one by going that way? Or the red-blue one by going that way? Hmm... That's a tough choice. Um, so, she already knows that I'm going to be doing crazy stuff in this dungeon. So she figures, hey, if I get deeper quicker than her, I get first dibs on stuff. So she's a little bit less attracted to the dungeon because she knows I'm such a dungeon master. If you'll pardon the pun. Um, so she's kind of tempted not to go for the red-blue. Although, remember, she could take this resource... Not for its red to make her better at the dungeon, but for its blue to make her better at exploring. Exploring gives you all kinds of bonuses, most notably relics, which can be the source of huge points at the end of the game, especially if you push your relic track up. Which also, I'm sorry, didn't quite fit on screen. Um, and, you know, and the dungeon gives you all kinds of bonuses as well, and gives you artifacts, which are a source of points, but not potentially quite as powerful as the relics, depending on how you invest. If instead she goes this way, she could get a purple-brown. That's going to help her with the Historians. The more power you have with the Historians, the more flexibility you have for free bonus actions. And knowing Jen, that's what she wants. She likes free bonus actions. So now, Jen has two brown-purple resources. Two of these parchments. So she could do super powerful brown or purple turns. Now, she can never get another one of these. Yet most you can have two. So at the end of the game, if you've got all six, you're doing great. You're powerful in all the guilds. But anyway, Jen just spent three of her four action points to grab a purple resource. She has one more point now. And if she wants to spend it, it has to be with the blue guild. And here's the problem. It's not two or three, so she can't make herself better with the guild or get a resource. It's only a one. So if Jen spends one to reset, this isn't spent yet, so she can't use it for that purpose. So you think, oh no, she's wasting her action point. No, because whenever you are interacting with any of the six guilds, if you've got extra action points and you don't know what to do with them, or you just don't want to do what's available because somebody else beat you to the thing you really wanted, you can always pump your action points into the Stone Council. Jen has one more point left. She's not going to use it over here. She is going to come to the Stone Council and be the first, as the blue player, to start working her way up the track. And what does she get for her trouble? She moves up one step on the Queen's Ambition track. This is the picture for Queen. Whenever you earn this, you move forward on the Queen's track. And that's a big deal. Because if Jen moves forward one more step, she gets to interact with the Queen and issue challenges for all players. She gets to set the agenda of the entire game by deciding what objectives we're scoring. And then if she keeps climbing, if she makes it here and tries to go again, she just starts earning straight up victory points. So you can have a very valid strategy of just trying to make good with the Queen and earn a lot of points that way and determine what objectives all players chase after. Plus, you get points for doing that as well. So this can be a huge... This could be maybe your biggest source of points in the game, potentially, depending on how things evolve. Or your biggest source might be relics. There's it's all kinds of ways things could advance. So anyway, Jen spent her fourth action point to get in good with the Stone Council, which gave her uh, more influence with the Queen. Jen has spent her four action points. And now, at the end of her turn, remember, Jen could do free actions. If she wants to, she could spend this to refresh her spent resource. She's not going to, because she could do that at the beginning of a turn as well. So she's going to wait and see how things evolve. But anyway, folks, we have finished the first of uh, 21 rounds. Oh my goodness, we've got a long ways to go. And of course, if there are other players, they would all take their turns doing green or something else if they chose. But anyway, the queen says, is everybody done? Okay then, it's time to explore. And something very important happened. Uh, you will note that Jen has this cool little advisor, who I love calling the Lazy Boys, because it looks like they're in an incredibly comfortable um, fantasy barca lounger or you know, a reclining chair. Um, as soon as, Jen, as the Queen met Jen's advisor, 
Jen became the first player. I was the first player when we started the game, but now Jen is the first player, and she will be first for exploring, for adventuring, for building, and then finally, when we make it all the way over here, she'll visit my advisor, and then I'll become first player for um, historian, for scribes, which is terrible. This is the one time when being first doesn't matter at all. And so I am unhappy about that being there. And then finally, for um, merchants. And you saw what a big deal it was for me to be first with merchants. I got to set the stage. Jen gets first dibs on exploring, dungeoneering. It's interesting. Dungeoneering, it's, uh, they're opposite of each other. Dungeoneering is probably the least impacted by... or the, Scribes is the least impacted. Dungeoneering is the second least impacted. These other four are hugely impacted by turn order. And Jen now gets to be first because her advisor whispered in the ear of the queen. So... Um, that means I say goodbye to the first player marker. It's uh, in Jen's backyard now. And we will go through this whole process again. First of all, does Jen have a guild bonus for blue? No? Skip that. Is Jen going to spend, um, do a free action? Nope, she's saving it for when she needs it. Uh, and now, is Jen going to do blue? Yes, she will do blue. She will not spend resources to do another green or to jump ahead to red. So, then... Is she going to pump it? Does she have a bonus for blue? No, she does not. Is she going to spend her blue res her blue slash red resource? Yes, she is. So that means Jen has one, two, three action points to spend all the way up there at the far northern edge of the kingdom on that little menu. And I know it's far away and out of focus, but basically what this says is for two action points, you can build this adorable little tower. And get bonuses, get the relics that are out there in the world. Or, this one says, for one, three, or six um, action points, you can build one, two, or three bridges. And um, to build in the towns and build towers in those different towns to get the relics, you have to build bridges to connect. So, Jen has three action points to spend. That means she could build two bridges. Or, she could build um, one bridge for one, uh, and then for her other two, she could build a tower. And because she is first, she gets first dibs on all this stuff. So what is she going to do? Well, remember, I was saying all these different relics that you can grab, and I should say, by the way, in a solo or two-player game, there are actually two relics in every city, and when you build a tower there, you get to see what the other one is and then pick one and the other one is out of the game. At higher player counts, there's only one relic per city. So Jen's looking at all those potential relics, and each one of those relics has the potential to increase the value of something. If Jen has this relic, um, red envoys, and we haven't earned any envoys yet, are potentially worth more points to her. If she has this relic, then brown seals are worth more to her. And so she's thinking, hey, if I'm going to grab a relic, what do I want to become better at? Well, remember, as part of setup, Jen started with a purple seal. And seals... Uh, can be very valuable and tough to get. Currently, Jen has the monopoly on um, 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 purple seals, and she notices there's this one up here that makes her purple seals worth more points. And Jen says, you know what? I want that. And then I want to get more purple seals so that I can chase a purple seal strategy. So she has three action points, and she wants to build a tower in that town to get that. Or heck, maybe whatever else is in there, she'll like that one more. She'll find out. But to be able to build a tower and spend two action points in that town, she first has to, there has to be a completed road to that town. Which means, Jen is going to spend one of her three action points to build her first bridge. Her second one would then cost two more. So, building two, it costs three. Building three costs six. Um, she doesn't have six. She has three. So, she's going to build one. She is going to put it right here, in between those two towns, and she gets a bonus. Whenever you cover up anything in this game, you immediately get the bonus. Jen just moved up again on the Stone Council track. Okay, hold on there, folks. I do not know what is wrong with my brain here, but this is the deal. I just uh, earned an advancement on the Queen's track, the, the Queen's Ambition track, but my brain misinterpreted the icon and had me advance on the Stone Council track. So, uh, 
just FYI, I'm moving up on the wrong track, and I'm going to do this a few more times throughout the video, which is why you should turn on those Klingon subtitles, because Paula will catch it every single time. Uh, the impact on the run-through itself means that in uh, this run-through, we should have been fighting for control over, um, you know, affecting the Queen instead of the Stone Council, so things are going to be a little bit different. There'd be more victory points earned and less advisors deployed, but still, I think you're getting a good idea of how the overall game feels. But just FYI, folks, turn on those Klingon subtitles because Paulo always keeps me honest. Now let's get back to it. So Jen, by spending one action point, um, takes one of her advisors from her board thereby creating a spot that an envoy could go, and we'll worry about envoys in a bit. And now Jen can put another one. And because here's the deal. Remember, I was talking about first player. If Jen would like to hold on to first player, she might want to put it over here. Because, hey, she's first player. First, 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 first. I get to be first player for a brief second, and then Jen becomes first player again. Just like that. So, Or, if Jen wants to, she could actually put it here in the Historian. Now, that would bump me down. I would get a victory point, which is nice. But then Jen would be first player for the entire game. I would never get to be first again unless I put my own advisor. And I think that's what Jen's going to do. Jen's going to totally control the Stone Council. So, hey, I got bumped down. I got a victory point. That's something. That's some consolation. But Jen will be first with all of the guilds unless I get my own advisors out there onto the board to counteract her influence. No! Oh! All right, so... Jen got that bonus, and now she has two more action points. She's going to spend them to build her first tower, thereby revealing another place that she could send envoys to do more bonuses. And Jen is going to build that tower. She could build it in this town or this town. Like I said before, she's going to build in that town. And now nobody else can build in that town. And her options are uh, make purple seals more valuable or gray seals more valuable. That's interesting. I have a brown seal. Jen says, nope, I'm going to stick with my purple plans. So um, this goes away. It's out of the game. And Jen takes her relic, and it's adorable. She puts it in her little relic cabinet, where she gets one of four different bonuses. She can get more ink for bonus actions. She can get popularity to attract envoys. She can get another step on the Stone Council track, which will get her some popularity. Or, uh, the fourth one, she can actually start working the relic track. Because, right now, we're over here, and this says, for three, um, you know, whatever relic you've got. You know, Jen has the purple relic. It says, hey, if you've got three purple seals, that's worth one point. But if she can climb her way up, then two seals become a point. If she makes it all the way to the top, which you can't even see, because it's off the top of the board, she can make every purple seal worth a point. So, if she wants to set herself up for grabbing a lot of purple seals, and looking around the board... There's a couple of purple seals sitting over there in the Historian Guild. Then Jen might want to say, I'm going to take this bonus and start climbing up this track so I can make, right? She doesn't change anything, but she can make purple seals be worth a third of, go from a third of a point to a half a point to a point. She could do that. She's going to save that for later because she wants more stuff right now. She's going to put this right here and move forward again on the stone track. And this time, her bonus is she gets. One, um, what do you call it? One uh, popularity, which I haven't even talked about this yet. Remember, these envoys, which can be the source of, of action points, which Jen is unlocking at a rapid pace. To get them, we have to prove our popularity. Jen just moved one step forward on the popularity track. If she moves one, two more steps, she can recruit an envoy, which is the source of more actions. Right. And that was it, folks. You can see why, even with just three action points, that was a lot of stuff to do. She knows now, wait, did I have any more action points? No, I didn't, because I was keeping track with that over there. And now, at the end of her turn, if she wants to, she could um, spend her um, ink to do these. She's still saving that. Um, but if she had any envoys, she could send her envoys now to these newly activated bonus actions. But she doesn't have any envoys yet either. But she's working on that by increasing her popularity. Phew! Yowza! All right, so that was Jen's second action. It is now my second action. And I've got to ask myself, am I going to spend this so I can go from having one blue to having three blue, like Jen, and then I could do the same thing and you know what? That would probably be the wise thing. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something wild and crazy. Remember how I talked about how you can ignore 
the Queen's Edict, and she says, hey, go explore, and you could pay resources to ignore that, and how you normally wouldn't do that in the first year because you're really kind of poor. I'm going to put that to the test. I... Oh, wait, I am going to spend this not to make myself better at blue, but to ignore the queen's blue rule and do a dungeon action instead. Boom! I say, nay, queen, there are dangers in that dungeon that need to be delved. So let's dive deep, shall we? And now, how many action points? I'm not going to do blue like Jen did. I'm going to do red. And uh, there's a simple reminder. Every action point you spend lets you move one step deeper in the dungeon. There's branching paths. All kinds of bonuses you could get. And so, how many action points do I have? Three, because I've already upgraded my standing. So I'm going to get to take three steps. Now, if I had another resource, I could spend it and bump up to five. If my book was flipped, so I'd have plus one. That would be great. But I'm going to get to do three st uh, steps. I'm going to walk on the wild side. And again, the dungeon... It couldn't be much simpler. I spend my action points to move my torch forward. I made it. That was one action point. I made it to the first room. That got me an ink. So, I've got more ink now. I move to the second room. Oh, shoot, 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 shoot. Oh, no. I'm wasting something. Because here's the deal, folks. This second room, this benefit says, hey, you know what you get to do right here? You get to remove ink from spent scrolls. And I haven't spent any of my ink yet. Oh, no. You know what, folks? I've got a plan. Here's what we're going to do, folks. I'm about to start delving the dungeon. I've got three action points. I step, or, But before I delve the dungeon, I'm going to do a free action. I haven't done any so far. I'm gonna before I start doing things. I'm gonna spend my one ink I've got to increase my popularity. It goes up one for every seal. I've only got one seal, so it's not a great time to do this. But hey, I just got some popularity like Jen. I'd like to get some on boys. So that was the free action I did. Now I take my three action points. I start dungeon delving, and boom, I give myself another ink. And then, boom, I move to the next room. I get to clear this scroll out so I can activate it again. And that ink goes back to supply. And then, boom, my third step, I have a choice. Clear out another ink. I don't need to because there aren't any. Or give myself another ink. So now, I have two ink available to me. I could activate both of these scrolls whenever I feel like it as a free action. And, I've got, and that's it. That's as far as I can go. But I'm not done with the dungeon yet, folks. We'll see soon what's going to happen. So anyway, at the end of my turn, and I, you know, I could have used some of those points to move on the track, but I didn't. It's fine. I just made the best use I could of those. And hey, I got a little bit of popularity out of it like Jen. Done with the dungeon. Um, done breaking the Queen's rules. And we're moving on to round three. Jen is still and forever the first player, unless I do something about it. And Jen says, oh... Time for me to go to the dungeon. The queen says go to the dungeon. I'm going to go to the dungeon. Now, Jen has no red resource because she spent it to explore. So her knapsack is empty. So that's not going to help her go to the dungeon. She does not have any love or any influence. So Jen has one action point, which means Jen could move forward one and get an ink. Or Jen could say to heck with it, I don't even care about your stinking dungeon. It's gross. I'm just going to move forward one. And, um, boom, hit this space and have an audience with the queen. That's what Jen is choosing to do with her one action point. She's not even going to try the dungeon like me. She made it to the queen. And so, here's what happens. These three things that were put out as um, part of setup are potential feats we could engage in. Getting four points for... Um, oh, I'm sorry, no. Getting a certain number of points for having all four advisors on the Stone Council. Getting a certain number of points for having four guild upgrades. We haven't done any guild upgrades yet. Getting a, a certain unknown number of points for having upgraded our rank four times. I've already done it once. Three more times, and this could be valuable to me. But currently, none of these nets you any victory points. But Jen's about to change that. Because as part of setup, each of us has uh, randomly selected all these feet tiles. Now, at higher player counts, the feet tiles are actually little triangles. But it is a two-player game or a solo game. They're these diamonds. So it's like, hey, when I'm putting one of these down, I'm actually filling up space twice as fast. So anyway, 
Jen has those four feet. She is going to pick one. She is going to put it here in the queen's chambers, in the, in the throne room. There's the throne right there. And then she is going to mark it with one of these, saying, by issuing a challenge to the kingdom. Uh, you know, she's going to talk the queen into issuing a challenge for points. Now, she looks at hers, and she has this one. This one says, purple seals. Remember, Jen likes purple seals. She already has a relic that says, hey, get more purple seals. Jen's going to issue a challenge to the entire kingdom saying, go get purple seals because she's planning on monopolizing. And she's first player, so she's going to get first dibs on purple seals and she's going to get points off of that. She's going to get points off of that. And she, purple is her favorite color. So it's all coming to plan. So let's uh, take a closer look at the queen's throne room. Okay, so Jen has to take this diamond and put it at least next to one thing. So she can't put it here or here. She can put it there, 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 or there. And when she puts it, let's say she just puts it like this. She then has these three little things that are worth two, three, or four points. She will put one of them either here or here. And what that means is she has, or she has gotten the queen to issue two challenges. One of the challenges is, hey, everybody, you can get three points at the end of the game if you've got two purple seals and um, three brown envoys. Um, and because she put this here, hey, everybody, at the end of the game, you can get two points if you've... Or actually, Jen wouldn't do that. She'd do this. You could have two points if you've got two purple seals and four guild upgrades. And Jen doesn't have to say it's two. Jen could say it's three or even four points if she wants. And remember, Jen's planning on trying to monopolize the seals because of her relic that's on display in her little cabinet. So um, if, she, if she's confident she'll have those two purple seals. And then if she gets these upgrades, that's four points. Also, by putting the four out, she's going to score four points immediately. If she puts the two or the three out, she'll score two or three points immediately. And then everybody has the opportunity to score those points. And Jen reckons if she can keep purple seals away from everybody else, she'd be, because she wants to, because she wants more of them for her relic, she'd be the only one to score. She'd score the four points now, and she'd score them again later. So really, Jen's only decision is, where, what does she want to combine purple seals with? Guild upgrades? Rank upgrades? Or, um, what do you call them? The advisors? Remember, Jen's already got another advisor? I think she's going to come over here. She's going to say, hey... Four advisors plus two um, brown or two purple seals is four points. Jen, for doing this, gets four. One, two, three, four. She's off the board. You can just barely see her victory point thing. And she's planning on getting these four points again at the end of the game, which means I now know for a fact she's going to get a bunch more. She's going to try to maintain her stranglehold on turn order. She's going to try and draft these purple seals before I can. She's got the only public purple seal. Uh, she got that as part of setup. Now, because this is an objective I could try to do as well. And so now, I've got to get my... Uh, or I have to ignore this. And honestly, if Jen had made this two points, I probably would ignore it. Two points, ah, eh, whatever. You can have your two points now and your two points later. But Jen tempted me. She said, no, it's four points. And that was dangerous. Because Jen made it worth my while. And so now, I think she's going to find some competition for her precious purple seals because she got a little too greedy. Um, this is such an interesting way to create a communal objectives. It's kind of this push-your-luck thing. You want to put your four on the thing that only you think you can do, so that no one else will do. Um, if you think other players can do it, make it a lesser value thing. Oh, it's clever. But anyway, that was Jen's jaunt in the dungeon. She said, nope, I'm going to hang out at the council. By the way, if she goes up again, she gets another one of her advisors out. And she's working on that. Okay. <clears throat> Phew. Folks, we have just finished the third round. Let's move on to the fourth round, shall we? No, we haven't. I still get to go. What am I thinking? I forgot. I'm not first player anymore. So it's my turn to adventure, and you better believe I'm just going to adventure right now um, because I, I mean, I'm not going to pay Gray to skip ahead. Basically, I set myself up to take advantage of my rank upgrade by getting to do an adventure twice, two turns in a row, because I come here. Um, I don't have a plus one in my book. I don't have any resources, but I have three. So I have three more steps I can now take in the dungeon. So let's do that, shall we? Let's go dungeon delving more. I'm in this room, and I've got a choice to make. I can go this way or this way for my first. Then for my second step, I'll come here. And for my third step, I'll come here. Then I've got another branch if I were to do dungeons even more. I could go in either of those directions. So first of all, I've got to decide, am I coming here? This says I can take any of these face-up artifacts. 
Now, if I don't like those face-up artifacts, I think they're garbage, they're sources of points, and, I, they, and they, they would give me, and indirectly everybody else, an objective. If I don't like them, I could instead come this way, and this says, hey, draw three from the bag and pick one. Uh, and I don't have them in a bag, I just got them in a, a pile over there. So, I'm going to... Right, do, so i got to ask myself, for my first, am I going to take one of these? The, um, or am I going to try and get something else? What are they? Well, these give me points for having the majority of seals and um, envoys. And here's the interesting thing. These two things... This one says, hey, get two points if you have the most green envoys. This one says, get one point if you have the most green or purple. Get three points if you have the most green and purple. So... Right now, strictly speaking, of all the envoys sitting over here, unassuming on the boat, that were randomly drawn from a bag as part of setup. There's six colors. At this time, we got two reds. We got a brown, a green. Uh, we got no blues, basically. Strictly speaking, green is arguably the most valuable in the game because there are two artifacts in the dungeon that can pay out points for green. Are there any relics? That we could explore. Nope, I don't see any green relic. But you know, one of those relics says, "Hey, green envoys can be more valuable too." But I'd have to go searching for it if I were to try and explore it. I'd literally have to explore to find the relic I want. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's a good time to have green envoys on my side. So I'm gonna go this way, which says I don't draw randomly. I just pick one, and I'm gonna say I am trying to have, I get two points at the end of the game if I've got more green um, envoys than anybody else. Now, I've just made that valuable for everybody else because, hey, if people can beat me on the green envoys, I don't get my points. So that is a danger. But I'm looking at another thing. When I so talked about exploring up here, I know the first place I'm going to explore. Or, or, I'm sorry, I'm going to play build a tower is this city right here because I don't know what's underneath, but I know what's on top. A relic that says... Every artifact, and I just got my first artifact, is worth more points. So I'm trying to go for a dungeon-heavy strategy, getting deeper and deeper in the dungeon, because I'm really good at it. If I can get down here and get this one later on, I try to get the green envoys. So that was my first step. My second step is just going to let me finally get on the Queen's Ambition track. One more step, and I can create an objective as well. And then my third step is, boom... Move up one on the re the relic value track. I, I think this is discovery track or something like that. If again, if I can move this all the way up here and I have a relic, they're worth more points than they would otherwise be. So those were my one, two, three bonuses I got. And oh, if I could just go one more step, I could either get an ink or I could mess with the historians, which would be awesome. Oh, and hey, wait. I could have. Hey, folks, at the beginning of my turn, how about I use one of my mini inks I've got to refresh my blue-red so that when I got here, I activated this, which meant I had five action points. I can dive deeper, folks. Because I used my ink to refresh this, I can take two more steps, which means I can get to a dungeon scroll. I come this way to get an ink and a, this dungeon scroll, or I come this way to get a historian and this dungeon scroll. Oh, I can't believe I made it. Oh, I'm feeling good about myself. Feeling carefree. And these are both awesome choices. You can see how important having more ink is for bonus actions. But I think I'm going to go this way because I care right now more about the historian. So this is my fourth step. And remember, each one of these steps can get fairly complex, which is why I'm supposed to be keeping track of how many steps I've taken in case I forget. Uh, so I'm going to visit a historian, which means we're skipping ahead, folks. i got to talk about the Historian Guild, even though we haven't reached... We're not going to reach that for two more rounds, but I'm the first. Normally, during a Historian phase, you can spend one action point to move any of the Historians and get a benefit. I'm going to get to do that right now. I spent my action point to go deeper in the dungeon, and which one am I going to do? I know which one I'm going to do. Remember, there is now a heated race to get these purple um, seals. There's a red seal, there's a gray seal, another gray seal, a green, a brown, a blue, a brown, but we all care about those purples because of Jen whispering in the queen's ear. So, uh, And I know Jen is first, so I want to make it harder for Jen to be able to get those purple seals. Right now, this purple seal is available because there's a historian looking at it. This one is not because there's no historian. I get to move a historian. I'm going to tell this historian, walk away, dude. Just walk away from that seal. Because if Jen wants to get that, I want to make her pay for it. And I have him move over here. And because he covers up that space, 
You guessed it. I've got more ink, which gives me more bonus actions I could do. So, I have just now, both of those purple seals are off limits until somebody wastes effort to get the librarians or the historians back to them. So that was my fourth action. And now my fifth action is, I made it here. I get free ink. I've got dungeon ink now. And I get to put it here, here, or here to refresh a resource. And currently, my only face down resource is my red blue. So I'll put it right here. And that means my knapsack is full of provisions once more. So I am better at blue and red actions once more. And I have made it that far. Whew! Okay. Nice. I made it a third, over a third of the way into the dungeon in the first year. That was pretty, pretty good. I've ignored things. I've missed out on things, but we'll see how well that pays off for me. Phew. The queen is very... Oh, and don't forget, at the end of my turn, if I wanted to, I've got an action point. I could go on ahead and give myself another popularity because now... I am... Oh, oh, by the way, at the end of... Uh, should have put another artifact out. And this one says, Oh, Jen likes this one. Have majority of purple and or green seals. You know, Jen loves those purple seals. Anyway, I'm going to save my ink for my other one. If, if, I, if I had another seal right now, and I don't, but if I did, I would spend this right now so that I can make two steps because you get a step or a, a popularity for every... I would move up three, and I would grab that green while I can. But I'm a ways off from that. So I'm going to wait on that a bit. And then the queen says, Impressive, young squire. And now it's time to build the city. People, Rome demands housing. Or the sixth realm does. And um, Jen is going to be first again. And folks, we're just getting started. And if you would like to see the rest of this first year play out, you can hit that eye in the top right corner of the screen and go to the extended playthrough. Or... If you just like to know how the rest of the game works in more of a traditional teaching format, you can go watch uh, Alex teach me how to play the game, or you can just go right to Final Thoughts to hear what Jen, uh, and Al, or J Jen and I thought of the game. It's your choice in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. But I'm a ways off from that, so I'm going to wait on that a bit. And then the Queen says, Impressive, young squire. And now it's time to build the city. People, Rome demands housing, or the Sixth Realm does. And um, Jen is going to be first again. And folks, we're just getting started. And if you would like to see the rest of this first year play out, you can hit that eye in the top right corner of the screen and go to the extended playthrough. Or... If you just like to know how the rest of the game works in more of a traditional teaching format, you can go watch uh, Alex teach me how to play the game, or you can just go right to Final Thoughts to hear what Jen, uh, and Al, or Jen and I thought of the game. It's your choice in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.